Good morning, everyone. It's good to welcome you uh, to our service this morning and to welcome uh, visitors with us again this Sunday. And we give you a warm welcome, those of you who are here in connection with our baptism later in our service, and just any other visitors who are with us uh, this morning. We're glad to see you as we gather together uh, to worship God. If you're watching online or listening on CD, we thank you for doing so, and we trust that together uh, we will know the Lord's blessing uh, through our, in our service uh, today. You'll have to forgive me uh, my voice. It's been a ropey all week. This is the best day, I hope, because um, this is only the second of three services. Uh, so just be patient uh, with me uh, through uh, the service. Let me make some announcements uh, for us uh, this morning. Uh, just a note for Sunday school. So boys and girls in P1 to P7 and any visiting children are welcome to go to Sunday school after the baptismal hymn, after uh, hymn number 371. And then our baptism will finish. That's when the children go to Sunday school. Our evening service this evening is at 7 o'clock in Ryan's with our friends in Ryan's, continuing our studies in the Book of Psalms. I'll not mention all the announcements. They are printed for you. Just to remind members of the cemetery committee, we meet tomorrow at half seven. And then our youth club recommences this Saturday from 7.30 to 9 p.m. For any young people in year eight and above, there are parental consent forms, these little ones in the vestibule, uh, for, for any, any young person who's coming along uh, to Youth Club, please take one away with you and uh, fill it in before Saturday evening. Not this week, but next week, our Bible studies uh, start. And on Wednesday, the 9th of October, uh, the Wednesday morning Bible study starts. And um, there are some study books available uh, from Helen, from Gillian, and in the vestibule. So for those of you who go along to that, it'd be good to see some new people going along to that also. So the other announcements are printed for you. Please uh, read them. And if there's any applicable to you, please uh, take note of them. We also notice that the PW program uh, is available uh, this morning uh, for this incoming year. Now, these are the announcements. Let us worship God. We read in Psalm 95, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Well, let's do as the psalm says in our opening hymn, hymn number 160, hymn number 160, Glory be to God the Father.
<clears throat> well, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how good it is when we gather together to sing the praises of your name, to ascribe to you the glory that rightfully belongs to you, because you are God, the Lord, who has done marvelous things. <clears throat> your right hand and holy arm have worked salvation for you. You have made known your salvation and revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations and remembered your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. We praise you, our God, because you have revealed your salvation and righteousness through the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who gave his life on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for sin, as the one who alone has made salvation known, and who calls us to repentance of sin and to faith in him, that we would know you as our Father in heaven today and for eternity. We praise you, our God, that because of Jesus, we are able to draw near to you, to call on you in our times of trouble and need, to bring our prayers and petitions for others, and to confess our sin. Our God, we confess our sin this day. We confess our stubborn hearts and wills that refuse to bow the knee to Jesus and confess him as Savior and Lord, trusting him to rescue us from sin and bring us to you. We confess our stubbornness toward obeying your commands. We confess our unwillingness to tell others about Jesus, preferring the easy life that we might avoid suffering for Jesus. We confess our failure at times to keep the pattern of sound teaching and to guard the gospel which has been entrusted to us. We confess, O oh God, how easy it is to fall in with the world and deny Jesus before others. We bless you, our God, that Jesus died in our place so our sin can be forgiven. And we draw near in his name to confess our sin, that we will receive pardon from our sin, forgiveness for our sin, mercy in not receiving what our sin deserves, and assurance of sin forgiven. Grant us your grace, O God, that we will start again with the help of the Holy Spirit to walk in your ways, to grow in ever like, a greater likeness to Jesus. Our God, we thank you for this day, for your goodness and your mercy to us, your daily blessings, an abundance of good things. And we recognize that every good and perfect gift is sent from heaven above. We pray, Father, that as you have given gladly, generously, abundantly to us, so we in our offering of gifts and tithes have given gladly and generously to you for the advancement of your kingdom, the building of your son's church and the help of his people in need. Bless what we have given to the glory of your name. We pray, our God and Father in Jesus, for your grace to us this day. We pray your grace to us now as we welcome a little one into the life and fellowship of our congregation. And give us ears to hear your word, that we might respond in faith and in obedience to the glory of your name. And hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's lovely to be able to conduct a baptism uh, this morning uh, in our service. And the Lord said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants. The Lord said to Moses, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The sacrament of baptism is a celebration of the gospel that God so loved the world he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The gospel is not for us alone for the scriptures teach 
that the promise is also for our children. In baptism, we present our children before God in faith that the Father loves them and calls them into the family of the church, that the Lord Jesus welcomes them as he welcomed the little children long ago, and that the Holy Spirit will bring them in due time to respond to the call of the gospel. The sacrament of baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace which God has made with us in Christ. By baptism we are received into his church. Christ brings us from death to life, so that having been raised to life in him, we may live as heirs of his kingdom. The children of Christian parents, though they may not understand these things, are within this covenant and belong to the life of the church. In this sacrament of baptism, God calls both parents and church family to the sacred duty of bringing up this child in the knowledge of the Lord and in the fellowship and nurture of the church. Today we welcome Stacy and Andrew, who in faith present their child for baptism. Since their child is not yet of an age to speak for himself, his parents and you, this congregation, must make promises so that through Christian nurture, by the grace of God, he may come to profess his own faith in Jesus Christ and serve him in the church and the world. Let us pray. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, maker of humankind in your own likeness, redeemer of the world in Jesus Christ, we lift up our hearts in thanksgiving and praise that you care for us, that your love is not for us alone but for our children too. God, our Father, in Jesus Christ, we come before you this day to receive into the family of the church through the administration of the sacrament of baptism this child. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon us, that what we do here may be confirmed in heaven, and that this child receives the fullness of your grace and will always be counted among your faithful people. We pray, O God, for Andrew and Stacy, that in presenting their child for baptism they may be enabled to keep the vows they will make and lead their child to knowledge of and faith in your Son and to be part of his church. And grant our God that remembering our own baptism in which we are engaged to be Christ's men and women, we may now rededicate ourselves to his service and glory. And we pray these things in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would ask you all to please stand. <clears throat> this sacrament lays solemn duties on you as parents to make confession of your faith before God and to promise to bring up your child in that faith. In presenting this child for baptism, do you affirm your belief in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you trust in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior from sin and as Lord of your life? Depending on the grace of God, are you committed to living as a follower of Jesus Christ, led and empowered by the Holy Spirit? We do. And are you willing to provide a Christian home for your child and bring up your child in the worship and teaching of the church so that he may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life? To the congregation, this sacrament also lays solemn duties on you, the people of God, in this congregation. As we receive this child into the fellowship of the church, do you promise with God's help to be faithful in prayer, spiritual nurture, Christian example and influence for him and his family? The Lord give all of you the grace to keep the vows you have made this day. Sonny Andrew, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and abide in you forever. Amen. We sing the words of hymn number 288, the words of the Aaronic Blessing, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. very well behaved child. Sonny is now received according to Christ's command into the membership of the Holy Universal and Apostolic Church and is engaged to be the Lord's. We commit him into the care of his parents with the assurance of our love and prayers for them as they bring him up in the nurture of the Christian faith and in the fellowship of the church. Let us pray. God of amazing grace, in your mercy you have promised to be not only our God, but also the God of our children. We thank you for receiving Sonny by baptism into the fellowship of your people here on earth. Keep him always in your love. Protect him from the dangers and temptations of life. Guide him in knowledge and understanding of you and into saving faith and hope in Jesus Christ. God of our salvation in Jesus Christ, we pray for Stacy and Andrew in the great privilege and responsibility of being parents. Grant unto them your wisdom and patience to guide Sonny in the ways of Jesus Christ and the faith of the church. Let your peace and joy dwell in their home, that their family life might be instructed by faith, sustained by prayer, and governed by love. Strengthen them in their own baptism, that they may rejoice as children of you, the living God, and faithfully serve their children in the name and for the glory of Jesus. And we join together in the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, <coughs> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing together the words of our baptismal hymn, hymn number 371 in our hymn books, is chosen by Stacy and Andrew, child of blessing, child of promise. <laughs>
You know, it's wonderful to hear the noise of little children at a Sunday morning service, so it's just lovely to hear that. Uh, okay, we want to read God's Word this morning. We want to turn to Paul's second letter to Timothy, as we have been looking at over these past uh, number of Sundays. Second Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> and reading verses 11 to 18. Page number 1195. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 11 at the bottom of the page. And of this gospel, wrote Paul, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. <clears throat> what you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. But may the Lord show mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Amen. And we thank God uh, for his word. Forgive me while I replenish my glass. It's only water. Let us pray. Our God and Father in Jesus Christ, we pray now for the needs of others, doing so in the knowledge that Jesus is interceding for us <clears throat> before your throne of grace. Our O Lord, our God, we remember <coughs> the words of Jesus that any who would come after him must deny self, take up their cross, and follow him. We pray today, Father, for sisters and brothers in Christ across northern Nigeria who know the literal truth of, those, of Jesus' words, who experience great suffering for the sake of Jesus at the hands of Fulani militants and Islamist extremists. Father, we know these stories rarely make the news headlines. And we pray, Father, that as Christians are kidnapped and churches are burned and communities destroyed across northern Nigeria, you will thwart the plans of extremists and expose the lies that drive them to their evil deeds. We praise you, Father, for the forgiveness of the persecuted toward their enemies, and the prayers of the persecuted that their enemies will encounter Jesus, repent of their sin, <coughs> no gospel transformation in their lives. And we pray, Father, that the example of the persecuted will bless and challenge us in our commitment to Jesus Christ and our prayers for others. We pray, Father, that the enemies of the gospel in these lands will encounter Jesus, repent of their sin and no gospel transformation in their lives. And we pray that we will be a people who forgive and pray for our enemies as Jesus commanded. We pray, Father, for home and family life, we pray that where Jesus Christ is known and confessed as Savior and Lord, the greatest concern for the next generation will be to bring them up in the knowledge of and love for you and in that understanding of salvation which is in Christ Jesus. We pray for homes and families where Jesus Christ is not known and not confessed as Savior and Lord. We pray, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you will bring salvation to such homes and families, awakening hearts and minds to acknowledge sin and call on Jesus for salvation. And we pray, Father, for our church family. Bless us, we pray, as we enter a new season in church life. Grant us your grace that we will grow spiritually, grow in maturity and unity in Jesus, and that we will grow numerically 
as you add to our number new people and new families and bringing them to saving faith and hope in Jesus. Our God, hear our prayers, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Now we sing again uh, to God's praise, um, hymn number 450. Apologies, it's a bit of a typo on the order of service. Uh, hymn number 450, Jesus is King, and I will extol him. No matter what kind of organization we might belong to, or what society or group we might be a part of, there are always expectations of us, duties toward uh, the organization or the group to which we belong. And it's no different uh, for the Christian. As we've begun to work our way through Paul's second letter to Timothy, the great apostle has unpacked for us the gospel, the great and glorious good news of Jesus Christ, the great and glorious good news of life in Jesus Christ, of the power of God who saves us according to his purpose and grace. And then Paul goes on to outline the Christian's duty or responsibilities to this gospel. Now, for the sake of clarity, the duty of one who is not a Christian toward the gospel is to believe it, receive it, and start to live by it. The duty of one who is not a Christian is to repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ for salvation and start to follow him in their lives. Maybe that applies to some here today. And if that is so, then you need to hear the call of Christ to repent of your sin, to call on him for salvation and to follow him in your lives. But here in Timothy, uh, in this section in Timothy, Paul's purpose is to outline the Christian's duty or responsibilities to the gospel. And it's threefold. Three words, communicate, suffer, and guard. Firstly, the duty of a believer is to communicate the gospel. In verse 11, we read, And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And we can sense Paul's joy in the privilege he has been given. One commentator says that Paul's soul dances 
at the thought of his call. Paul was one who sounded forth or heralded the good news. He was one who was sent with a commission from Jesus to declare the gospel. He was a teacher as he taught the great doctrines of the faith. And the gospel is such good news that it cannot be kept locked up and away from others. Now, in case we're thinking, well, we're not the Apostle Paul, we must remember that the Apostle Paul was part of that original apostolic group, the, the 12 disciples minus Judas, and then the one who was added after that, and then Paul, who were sent by Jesus to proclaim the gospel, to teach the doctrines of the faith, and on whose teaching the church is built, teaching that we have received in God's Word, the Bible, teaching which is normative, regulative for the church in every age and place. Now, in that sense, there are no apostles in the church today, but there are certainly heralds of the gospel, teachers of the gospel. There are evangelists, there are pastors who proclaim and teach the gospel, the truth of God's Word. We have Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and others in the church who teach the Word of God. And Christian parents have a particular responsibility to teach their children the good news of Jesus Christ and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. And yet it is also true to say that to every believer, a responsibility has been given, entrusted to them by Jesus to share the good news of Jesus with others. I think of two women I know who are trying to do that, trying to find the right way to speak into the life of someone they know who is not a Christian, trying to, to utilize the right resources to give that might start a conversation. I think of, of an elderly gentleman it was witness to countless people over the long years of his Christian life. Every time he goes into hospital, he starts telling the nurses and the doctors and the therapists about the Lord Jesus and saying, I'll pray for you. What's your name? I'm going to pray for you. And only eternity will reveal the fruit of his labors. But the church is called to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified for sinners. Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. Jesus Christ, the salvation of the Lord our God. But who is the church? Well, it is God's people. It is people. So in Christ, we have a duty to communicate the gospel. And secondly, the duty of a believer is to suffer for the gospel. The Apostle Paul knows why he is suffering. He's a prisoner in Rome because of his devotion to and commitment to sharing the good news of Jesus. He wrote, that's why I'm suffering. He might also have said, I'm suffering because I've denied self, taken up my cross, and followed Jesus. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, the German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that when Christ calls a person, he calls them to die, that they might live for Christ. And living for Christ involves suffering for Christ. And Paul marvels in the privilege of his calling and, and declares he's not ashamed to suffer for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. This gospel that is so unutterably glorious and powerful and the only hope for the, la for the lost. <clears throat> and Paul is also not ashamed to suffer for the gospel because, as he writes here, he knows whom he has believed. Paul certainly knew what he believed, but here he declares the certainty of knowing whom he believes. And he believes God. He trusts the Lord. There's no wavering or doubt, only the profound confidence of perpetual faith and a constant relationship with the Lord. He's not ashamed to suffer for the gospel because he's also convinced that the Lord is able to guard what Paul entrusted to him for that day. The Greek can also mean what the Lord entrusted to Paul. Both are in mind, perhaps. The deposit could be what Christ has entrusted to Paul, gospel ministry, or what Paul has entrusted to Christ, his salvation. But the point Paul is making, that in a dark dungeon, cut off from life outside, separated from sisters and brothers in Christ, awaiting execution, he nonetheless lived with certainty and confidence in the Lord. Paul may have looked beaten, the gospel may have, been touched with, may have been out of touch with contemporary society. It may have felt that the gospel was under threat of extinction because, as we read, many had deserted Paul. 
but Paul nonetheless lived with certainty and confidence in the Lord. And it can feel like that today. It can feel as if the odds are stacked against the church and the gospel in the age in which we live, in the society in which we live. <coughs> it can be a struggle if we are the only Christian in our family or our workplace or our school class or university course or neighborhood. Wouldn't it be easier just to fit in? Wouldn't it be easier just to give up and say, well, it's easier just to go along with the ways of the world? But what would Paul say? Paul would say, no. Do you not know whom you've believed? Are you not convinced that the God of the heavens and the earth who has saved you in Christ is able to guard your salvation and your ministry until the day Jesus comes in his glory? What is suffering for the gospel when we think of it like that? Suffering for the gospel is only for a season when we compare what is promised in the gospel for eternity. A sincere faith in Jesus is an unashamed faith in Jesus, a faith that is willing to suffer, not go looking for suffering, but willing to suffer when it comes to our door because the believer knows in whom they have certain and confident belief. <coughs> Thirdly, then, the duty of a believer is to guard the gospel. We've already touched on this previously, but here Paul makes it explicit. In addressing Timothy, he wrote, what, I, what you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So there are two elements to these verses, what we are to do and how we are to do it. What, we are, what are we to do? We are to keep and guard the pattern of sound teaching and the good deposit that has come to us from the apostles. Well, there's so many threats, isn't there, today to the pattern of sound teaching of the Bible and the good deposit of the gospel that has come to us. Even sadly, within branches of the church, there's an undermining of this pattern of sound teaching and this good deposit. In his farewell to the elders of Ephesus, <coughs> Paul said to them, Keep watch over yourselves, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. <coughs> so be on your guard. And this was some years prior to Paul writing 2 Timothy, but the challenge still remained. Paul warned Timothy to be on guard, to stay alert, to keep the pattern of sound teaching and guard the good deposit that is the gospel. The same call remains today. Today there are savage wolves who will not spare the flock. Today there remains false teachers who distort the truth, who draw disciples away. And we are not at liberty to change the gospel, to change the Word of God. We're not at liberty to change the message of how one is saved into something else that fits with society, our own notions <coughs> of salvation. We're not at liberty to change the teaching that has come to us because we think, well, God's Word was written so many years ago, it's out of step with modern society. No, it's the other way around. The world is out of step with the Word of God. And so Paul says we are to keep the pattern of sound teaching that has come to us in the Word of God. We are to guard against error because false teachers remain. There are those who proclaim a different gospel, which is no gospel. There are those who would say that what God's Word teaches is no longer relevant and a whole host of issues, the hot potato ones being human identity, gender, marriage, and the sanctity of life. <clears throat> the challenge remains the same today as it did for Timothy, to guard the gospel, to defend the Word of God. But how are we to do this? Well, Paul helps us with faith and love in Jesus and with the help of the Holy Spirit, with keeping our gaze fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
and with dependence upon the Holy Spirit <coughs> to help us walk and to defend and to keep and to guard the gospel. And fixing our gaze on Jesus, seeking the help of the Holy Spirit, requires us to be humble before God, requires us to be dependent on God, requires us to be building ourselves up <coughs> in the holy faith that has been given to us. It requires us to be a worshiping and praying people, and a people like Onesiphorus who encourage one another to stand firm in the truth and hope of the gospel. And so followers of Jesus <coughs> have a duty to communicate the gospel, to suffer for the gospel, to guard the gospel, and the pattern of sound teaching that has been entrusted to us. In these days, we may face increasing suffering for the gospel. There may be more cause to defend the gospel as we seek to communicate it to others. So let's keep our gaze fixed on Jesus as we depend on the Holy Spirit to help us and all to the glory of our Father in heaven. Let us pray. We bless you, our God, for the reading and proclamation of your word to our lives this day. We thank you, our God, for the clear duties believers in Christ have toward the gospel, to communicate it, to suffer for it, to guard it. And we pray, Father God, with perhaps some degree of apprehension because we're unsure of how to communicate the gospel, maybe with some fear because we may one day suffer for the gospel, Maybe we just do not know how to protect it from false teachers. We pray, O oh God, that you will help us to keep our gaze fixed on Jesus and to remember the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us, to help us in our duties toward the gospel. And hear our prayer, for we pray in the name and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Our closing praise is hymn number 512, May the Mind of Christ My Saviour.
<clears throat> to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day until Christ calls or comes, and then forevermore. Amen.